Back in 1938, chemist Roy Plunkett was working to improve the efficiency of fridges, but he ended up making an amazingly slippery powder. He'd made PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene, known the world over by its famous brand name, Teflon. New black, no stain Teflon. Even hours after cooking, pans rinse clean in seconds. No soaking, no scouring. Teflon inside. It really is the slipperiest thing made by mankind. And that sounds like something that's got to be put to the test, which is where my friend Warwick comes in. Right. Well, when I say my friend Warwick, it's more Boris. Yes, Boris. Boris is a gecko. He's uh, got the stickiest feet, I would say, in the animal kingdom. This is Boris the gecko, performing for us the gecko test on a piece of glass. Well, that's Boris quite happily. There you go. That's vertical, maybe even a bit more, and is that's glass gecko tested by Boris. <laughs> now we must test Teflon. So, All right. let's perform the gecko test. Um, I've just realised this might be quite disconcerting for Boris, but I don't, Boris, don't think what I know you're now thinking. <laughs> We're using a frying pan because it's coated with the material, not because of, you know, the cooking thing. OK. I'm sorry, Boris, I'm really sorry. But well, I wouldn't blame him if he jumped straight out of this. Right, so let's try him on this. Oh, not a hope. <laughs> <laughs> we can't. Well, clearly then, our non-stick material passes the internationally recognised gecko test with ease. No, oh, it, it's, it's gecko proof. I think that really is the final word from our gecko tester. Teflon really is very, very slippery. Once the launch had begun, there was no going back. And PTFE proved itself on the wedges, sliding the massive steel road deck over the valley. All thanks to the wonder non-stick stuff called Teflon, discovered by luck in a lab. Now the engineers had to face their next big problem. How to construct the tallest piers ever built, each to a specific point in the sky with millimetre precision. The highest of these giants is 245 metres, as tall as a 70-storey skyscraper. And the other six aren't exactly short. They all had to end up in exactly the right place, within millimetres. They were only possible with the technology from the submarine war games of the Cold War. Engineers analyzed the stresses and strains on the bridge round the clock, 365 days a year. This is the control room where today cameras and sensors monitor the traffic, the wind, temperature and humidity. But back then, when the bridge was under construction, it was, if anything, under even closer scrutiny. Reflectors dotted about over the structure allowed the engineers to track the build and monitor the bridge's precise position. The engineers needed to build each towering pier up to a precise point in space, hundreds of metres above the ground, so it could meet the horizontal deck as it slid out, thousands of metres from the valley sides. A precise surveying network ensured that they got to exactly the right point in space, to within millimetres, impossible without a supremely accurate system of measurement. The kind you'd need to find a dot in the ocean. Q and next connection. It all started when US nuclear submarines began to get lost. The subs were designed to submerge for months with gyroscopic systems to record every move. But over time, tiny errors mounted up. When the subs surfaced out in the middle of the ocean, they couldn't work out where they were. A precision nuclear weapon is not much use if you don't know which way to point it. The US Navy's solution was to launch satellites. On surfacing, the subs would listen for the satellite signal to work out where they were. It was the very first use of satellites for global navigation, the foundation of today's global positioning system, or GPS as we all know it. But how does it actually work? 
And how could a signal beam from 20,000 kilometers away help engineers build a bridge to millimeter accuracy? The trick is to calculate how long a signal takes to get to Earth. If you know its speed and when a signal was sent, you can work out distance very accurately. To see just how this works, I'm meeting John Shelton, an expert in the field of acoustics. In a field. Hi, John. Hi, Richard. Well, I'm here, and, uh, well, frankly, I'm confused. So, first of all, how can you measure these distances? What are we going to do? Well, you know how GPS works. You've got satellites up in the sky that are beaming out signals down to us. Yeah. So, depending upon where we are on the surface of the Earth, by measuring the delay between those signals from the different satellites, we can find out exactly where we are. Because we know where the satellites are, and we can measure the delay. Yes, I can get that. That's right. The only problem is we haven't got any pet satellites. So instead of using radio signals, we're going to be using acoustic waves. Noise. Exactly. Yeah, OK. How? So, so what we need is a nice noise source. Ah. I've got my car. I can start it up. It makes quite a racket. Big V8. No, I, th I think we can do better than that. All right. It's this. I did wonder. It's in here. It's in here. Let's okay. see. Can I help? That's louder than my car. It's quite handy, isn't it? Good enough. Yeah. We've got the gizmo over here, and we're going to take this with us, and we're going to be making the noise as we go down and measuring the delay as we go. Are you coming with us, Chris? 20 degrees centigrade, sound travels at 340 meters a second. By walking away from the truck, then stopping and playing some notes, we can measure the delay between the sound leaving the speakers back at the truck and reaching us. John's computer uses this time difference to calculate a distance. Now! OK, let's yeah. try here. Right, OK, um, go on then, take it away. <laughs> I immediately noticed the delay between Chris playing and us hearing the sound. Let's rewind and check that again. Chris strikes the strings, then there's a delay before you hear the sound from the speakers. The electrical signal travels to the speakers the instant Chris plays, but it returns through the air at the speed of sound. When you get far enough away, the delay becomes quite obvious. John's computer measures the time it takes the guitar notes to get from the truck at A to us at B. From this, knowing the speed of sound, we can work out how far we are from the start. So a half-second delay would mean that we're 170 metres from the speaker stack, our own version of a GPS satellite. Seventy. There you go, thank you very much. So although what we've been doing was a bit, well, frankly, odd, if you were watching from over there, probably, but we were using a signal to measure distance. And it doesn't matter what the signal is, we use noise, it could be anything. If you know how fast the signal is travelling, and you know how long it's taken to get from one point to another, then you can use that information to work out how far apart those two points are. You don't need a guitarist. <laughs> The satellite signal the nuclear subs listen for contained data on the time it was sent and where it was sent from. And the more satellites you have, the more precisely you can fix your position. Measuring the delay from the time a signal was sent to the time it's received, you can work out how far you are from a satellite, just like we calculated our distance from the guitar amplifiers. Today, there are 24 global positioning satellites orbiting the planet, sending signals back to Earth. Now, GPS receivers use exactly the same principle, only with greater accuracy. They compare the distance from four or more satellites to determine their position. Your GPS receiver can work out where it is to within 10 metres. That's fine for directing your car, but completely useless in building a bridge where an error of 10 centimetres would be a disaster. 
The Milau engineers fixed GPS receivers to the deck and piers to keep construction on track. Their system was way more accurate than car sat-nav, but it still wasn't enough. Tiny temperature fluctuations and building stresses could send the piers and deck off course. And although successfully guided by the satellite data, they needed to double check their GPS positions against a rock solid reference point. So they anchored one to the ground. The engineers took GPS guidance a step further. They bolted a receiver to a fixed point on the side of the valley, and it provided a reference signal for all the other receivers on the piers. And because it's anchored, it reduced the error of the GPS signal down from meters to millimeters. The network of monitors on the bridge constantly checked the accuracy of their position data against these known points. And all the time, the towers climbed skywards. So that's how a technology for locating lost subs positioned with pinpoint precision the world's tallest piers. But Milau's steel roadway, weighing five times more than the metal used to build the Eiffel Tower, needed support from above as well as below. And that's where cables come in. When the deck was being pushed out over the top of the piers, the engineers used a web of cables to support the end of it. And they held it in place even when the winds blasted up the valley. So how did 36,000 tons of steel roads stay put in a valley notorious for storm force winds? The answer lies with a series of accidents in a German silver mine. In winter and early spring, Europe's weather can turn on its head. Low pressure over the Mediterranean sucks cold air from the north down through the south of France. The Tarn Valley is pretty much your perfect winter, channeling mountain storms along its length. Winds here can reach 130 kilometers an hour. That's a pretty severe test for the cables here on the Milan Bridge. They take the strain, but it's only because of a series of mining accidents that they exist at all. Throughout history, miners have hauled heavier and heavier loads up from below ground. But this put dangerous stresses on the traditional pulleys and ropes used. Man has made rope since the earliest times, and depending upon where you lived, you could choose from a range of different plants to make it. In Asia, a relative of the banana plant was used to make manila. And then across much of Europe, cannabis, of which this is a relative, was used to make hemp, amongst other things. Rope is usually made by twisting fibers together, but it does have its limitations. To understand rope's limitations, I've decided to break some, and materials expert Clive Sivier is going to help me. OK, Richard, what we've got here um, is a hydraulic press yep. with a load cell here. Yeah, OK. So it's going to pull on there, yep. and this... That's going to tell us the force that this is supporting. Yes. And this is rope as was used initially in the silver mines, as exactly. well as everywhere else. Yeah. I'm going to start the machine by pressing, I'm guessing, the big green button. Taking up strain. Right, so we just started to stretch the rope now. This is a 10 millimeter hemp rope, about the thickness of my little finger. Now we're just starting to increase the load. We've just hit 30 kilograms. 30. Oh! The yeah. rope is stretching a lot, it as we call lot, it. Yeah. yeah. And here we go with the loads increasing. We've just hit 100 kilograms. 200. And we're now on 260 kilograms. Yeah. And now we're just hitting 300 kilograms. And it is stretching. Oh! And there we go. The rope doesn't break suddenly, but it gradually, um, different strands of the rope start to break individually. Um, it's still supporting some oh. load until eventually, eventually the final strand oh, will break. That. And that's your lot. Got to 640 kilograms. That's nearly two thirds of a ton. So the way it breaks is useful. That's but right. The weight at which it breaks is not so good. The rope breaks gradually. Single strands break, but the rest of the rope um, still holds some of the load. And so it doesn't sort of just give up. So we need now to test something. Exactly. Strong. 